the weather outside feels like we shouldn't actually be here but elsewhere, but there we are. This is a great occasion for all of us to gather on this 21st day of August 2014 for our fall faculty assembly. My name is Paul Lim. I'm the uh, chair of the faculty senate for this year. Um, we're going to hear from a very distinguished member of our community as part of our presentation. Um, I live with first year students on the Ingram Commons, which has been a key delight in my life so far in the last seven years. And I've had several baseball players uh, live in Crawford House. Almost every one of them used the word mentor to, de to describe Tim Corbin, their head coach. And I found it quite, quite curious. They would rather talk about his mentor than coach. And that kind of trend continued on until last year. And lo and behold, uh, the Vanderbilt University men's baseball team won the NCAA championship, also known as College World Series. So I thought. <laughs> I met Tim about five years ago when I had him come to Crawford House for a function to talk about his life. And one word that I'll use to describe Coach Corbin is humility, which may or may not be the word that you'll use on an athletic coach. But so for more than one reason, it gives me a great delight to welcome to the podium uh, the head baseball coach, Tim Corbin, who's going to talk about, uh, give a presentation entitled, Winning is Not Everything with a Question Mark, Reflections of a Baseball and Life Coach. Please join me in welcoming Coach Tim Corbin. Thank you very much, Paul, Nick, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and um, I, I do appreciate this. In advance, I, I do want to congratulate the uh, faculty members who will be welcomed here with 25 years of, of service. Um, we, we certainly appreciate that, and the award winners as well that will be recognized this afternoon also. Start of a, another year at the university, which uh, for us and for us, people who are, are getting older, the, the clock ticks. And as I tell the kids every year, the time goes by very, very fast, so, so we utilize it. The commonality, obviously, is uh, what we, we all do, and that is teach, teach kids. Um, we are in that profession. And I use the word kids in the most re respectful way. Uh, it, it represents innocence to me. Uh, it, it represents growth potential in, in what I think is the most important muscle that, that God made and the one that has no color, and that, and that is the brain. And I talk to many recruits about this as well when I'm talking about our program. It's the one that can be bent, it the, it's the one that can be twisted, and it's the one that can be stretched. But in, in my way of thinking, it, it's the only thing that leads to our, our physical skills as, as athletes. I consider myself first and foremost, and, and Paul mentioned mentor, and that certainly is a compliment, but I, I, I consider myself as a teacher. Uh, I, I taught first in, in high school, and I figured I was going to be in New Hampshire the rest of my life as a teacher. And lo and behold, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, coaching and, and mentoring. Hence, when Gordon Gee in 2004 asked me, we're going to make some improvements to the baseball facility, uh, what would you like to see? And I said, a classroom. And he said, come again? And I said, a classroom. And it is the most important room in our culture because I start there every day. In fact, I, I started the other day with our team when we met for the first time at 4.06, Tuesday afternoon, always before the first day of classes. And I'm dressed like I am today because it's a very important day for me because it's the establishment of a, another group of people. It's the establishment of, of another family. Several nights before the meeting, and I, I do get anxious moments for this meeting because I want it to go right, I woke up with a dream. And the dream was so real that I went into the living room and started to jot some notes down. And the dream went like this, and I'm going to share it with you is I left Vanderbilt University and started my own high school for boys. This is the truth. In this school, there would be no cell phones, no television. We would only use video as a way to review our work. This school would have no rules, only standards. Inside this high school, the first activity of the day for every student would be to stand at attention for the national anthem. In this school, students would embrace all genres of music, 
and be encouraged to develop a musical skill. Proper hygiene would be taught daily. <laughs> Brushing your teeth and taking care of your face would correlate with confidence and physical positive energy. Students would understand the phrase positive life force. Everyone would pick up trash. Anyone's trash is everyone's trash. Body language would be as important as verbiage. Keyboards, keypads, and phones would not be used as ways to communicate. In this school, conversation skills and eye contact during conversation would be imperative. In this school, confrontation would be seen as a positive word and be part of corrective behavior. Students would be taught the importance of confidence, self-esteem, and humility. They would understand that maturity is responsibility and the capacity to do the right thing, but we would still want to hold on to their childlike innocence. In this school, creativity would be just as important as literacy. Development of the kids' creative capacity would be paramount. In this school, we would not stigmatize mistakes. Mistakes would be embraced. Kids would take a chance and not be afraid to be wrong or look stupid. In this school, students would understand the value of a dollar bill. Items would have monetary value. Industriousness would be the norm, not uncommon behavior. These students would be elite, but in no way come across as elitist. In this school, the words work, practice, and grind would be replaced with investment, training, and daily progressions. Judgment, responsibility, toughness, self-control, faith, hope, and charity would be woven into the core curriculum of this school. They would understand that a person who has a disability is a person with great ability. In this school, teachers would encourage but not over compliment. The populace of the school would be very diverse. That would be purposeful. Subsequently, we'd learn and celebrate all cultures and embrace all backgrounds. Ego would be understood as a healthy word as long as its application was surrounded by team and group. Arrogance, on the other hand, would not be worn well in our small community. It would be seen as a dirty word that looks ugly on everyone. We would replace the word I with us, me with we, thus changing the name of our phones and our pads to we pads and we pads. <laughs> Servant behavior would be core value of the school. In this school, students would be the protector of God's greatest creation, their mother, their sister, their grandmother, their aunt, their friend, all females. There would be no parent-teacher conferences. Parents of these students would be asked and encouraged to release the opportunity to their kids. Students would be shown how to love their parents more, but depend on them less. Students would understand that each one of them has the capacity to be a leader, and that leadership would start in their own home, but they would also understand that leadership begins and ends with character. Leadership and shared responsibility would be highly valued and reinforced. The goal of this school would be to find and develop the passion of every single person who attended. They would understand that we grow from every experience, good or bad, celebration or devastation. The past is a place of reference, not residence. Move from it, grow with it. In this place of learning, we would be goal-oriented. We would not be goal-oriented, but rather growth-oriented. Although all participants are titled students, teachers, principals. Titles would not set individuals apart in this culture. Each person would carry the same value. But most importantly, and most importantly, kids would understand the importance of the moment. Right now is important. Would not look ahead, not count days, not granted another second beyond where we are right now. Use it to your advantage. When we were done with a day, we'd leave the facility and it would look better than when we arrived. This was my dream. But this school does, in fact, exist. It's 200 yards across the street. Those are the daily progressions and content of the program. And they mean a, a great deal to me. When I celebrated or, or started talking to the kids the other day, and I, I do have a couple PowerPoints, and I'll just show them to you briefly. This one is uh, one that I borrowed from John Wooden, but I, own, I created my own pyramid. And basically, it's the start of creating a culture of quality, 
And what I just talked about is daily progressions and our foundations, as you can see. Building a home and developing a team, the groundwork of the culture, the principles that support our program must be formulated. That's the foundation. We build the foundation to develop the family. That's where you see the people. We develop the family to better serve the program for the betterment of the university. By developing the most important muscle, socially, emotionally, and academically. And then at the very top, the star V is to succeed in the school individually. I think the philosophy of a lot of athletic programs is, is winning. And when I tell our kids the first time I, I speak to them that that will not be the focal point, I think they look at me a little weird and say, Coach, we know if we don't win at Vanderbilt that your job could be replaced and someone else could do it. But I will always tell them the prime directive of our program is to build a standard of performance in everything that we do, one that will sustain us, installing a level of proficiency and competency so the production level of the group can become higher in all areas. We focus on improving the execution and the content of our thinking, actions and attitude. From there, the scoreboard will take care of itself, always has. Philosophy with the kids is just changing the target. Sometimes the target becomes a scoreboard. Sometimes the target becomes a score itself. It's funny when you change the target, how that scoreboard and how that score can work in your favor. I got a letter from a player this summer. It was on my desk, and I'll just read you a quick paragraph of it. No name, no address, no nothing. He said, as I sit and reflect on the first half of my college career, it's obvious to me there is absolutely no amount of money that can buy the experiences that I've had the friendships that I've made, the stories that I have collected, priceless, invaluable. You, coach, have succeeded in your goal. You've created a place where young, talent, talented kids from all over the country can come and learn to fail because it is from our failures and our ability not to fear, fear failure that we truly have learned to succeed. Last three words, I love you. No name. I know exactly who it is. He's filled with humility. He wouldn't put his name down because he wouldn't draw attention to himself, nor in his mind, a plain edge. I know exactly where that comes from. Those are the paychecks that we receive in teaching, in mentoring. And that is why we all have a lifestyle and not a J-O-B. Through my position at Vanderbilt University, I've used our program as a platform to teach social awareness skills. And it's really the first step in becoming a better man. It's the first step in becoming a better teammate. And it's a first step in learning the whole rather than the part. And from that, you succeed so much more. My personal story is just quick, um, and, and I'll just share it quickly because it has a lot to do with my coaching philosophy. When I got married, uh, I married a young lady. I guess we weren't young. I was 35 at the time, younger. But she had two daughters. Hannah at the time was six, and Molly at the time was nine. Hannah went to school here, played tennis, got her master's degree here. Molly was at Vanderbilt, but unfortunately in the hospital for a long period of time, and because of Vanderbilt, and because of Nick, and because of so many other people, she's fine now. But the reason I tell you those things is I never in a million years thought I would be a step-parent. But being a step-parent was the most important thing that could have happened to me. Because when you learn to love someone else's kids, you learn to do the same thing with your own kids that you mentor, that you teach, that you coach. And I'm very fortunate to be in this position. Last slide right there is our classroom. It looks that way before the kids enter, and it looks that way when they, they leave. I ended my first meeting the other night at 6.06, two hours after I started. Like this meeting, I never mentioned the word baseball one time. Didn't talk about a ball, didn't talk about a bat, didn't talk about the sport. All we talked about was program. All we talked about them. All we talked about was foundations. That's the target. It's not because it's not important, but the only target right now is getting it right, getting the foundations right. This is what the classroom looked like, looked better than when they arrived, and like your legacy as a teacher, Vanderbilt was better because you were part of it, and you also left it better than when you arrived. You guys have a great year. I appreciate your time. Thank you.
you, Tim, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it's my delight to uh, introduce the team with whom I do the work as a faculty senate chair. Uh, the executive committee, um, right there. Uh, if you're here, could you please stand up and be recognized? Uh, the vice chair upon whom I rely so much, uh, Rolanda Johnson from the School of Nursing. And then the chair elect is Richard Williams Willis from Owen, right there. And then vice chair elect is Anne Price, is already right there, standing, medicine, School of Medicine. And immediate past chair is Donald Brady from the School of Medicine, who I believe is in Deutschland right now. And uh, immediate uh, past vice chair is Jeff Johnson from ANS and, and Chemistry. Okay, well, these are the committee members that. Uh, <laughs> And also, we have several committees and task force, and the chairs are here as well. Uh, um, Joyce Johnson, she's in the SPAF committee, Strategic Planning and Academic Freedom. Joyce. And then Academic Policy and Services, Brian Chrisman. Student Life, Joe Webby, is here. And then Faculty Grievances, Agnes Fogo. Faculty Life, Mel Ziegler, who's out of town from ANS. Senate Affairs, Buddy Creech from the School of Medicine. Online Education Task Force Ranga Ramamujan from Owen, and then Greek Life Task Force David Weintraub, uh, co-chaired by um, Greg Malcor Bards, and lastly but not la uh, least, a Faculty Manual Ad Hoc Committee, Maggie Tarpley. Okay, great. And the charges are in your, uh, just up there for your uh, pleasure and perusal. Um, so just quite self-explanatory in many ways. So I'll. Probably just go right to our important part of our of, of my brief remarks, which has to do with the strategic planning and faculty senate possibilities for a partnership. I think one of the things that are truly exciting about this year, academic year, is the fact that the strategic planning, as uh, Nick will talk about in a few moments, um, it'll be rolled out and it'll be of great importance and interest to all of us gathered in this room to see how what that'll look like, how that'll be actually implemented in the life of all of us here. So. Not that we need any review, but these uh, trans-institutional programs, undergraduate residential experience, healthcare solutions, and educational technology. I'll leave it to Nick to elaborate on those. And as uh, we had our retreat as Faculty Senate, we uh, talked a bit about um, how to complement and supplement and come alongside and, and uh, help make this a much better um, execution plan for us. So I thought maybe just for me, uh, three Gs that are kind of a positive for us to think through. Um, so undergraduate res uh, residential experience is wonderful and truly significant, but we all know that undergraduate um, education cannot exist apart from the presence of graduate students, and we know that we've done a graduate uh, uh, report on the task and the future of graduate education. So it's crucial for us to think about how this has been carried out and their well-being, grad students, and infrastructures that would ensure their flourishing. And secondly, globalization. We all know that Vanderbilt has become, uh, for better or for worse, a more recognizable name brand globally. Uh, many of our faculty members go travel abroad giving lectures, doing research trips, and winning prizes abroad. And also, many of our faculty colleagues scattered throughout the world come to this place. So we do want to kind of think more critically and crucially about the impact of globalization in the daily task of what it means to be uh, faculty members here at Vanderbilt. So that'll be an important uh, task for us to think through. And thirdly and lastly, about Go Vanderbilt, golden opportunity and obligation. Um, so I think, you know, as we are all very well aware of the fact that we as faculty members uh, have here at Vanderbilt have great opportunity and golden obligation to our students, staff, and one another. Um, it's, it's become much more of an issue globally and, and certainly within the U.S. about the issues of Title IX and campus safety, especially around sex, uh, personal, uh, power-based personal violence. I think this really does present a golden opportunity and great obligation for us to take a leadership role in addressing and implementing concrete plans for university-wide faculty training on this. So we'll be rolling this out hopefully soon and more on that. And another uh, golden opportunity and obligation is as we're all aware of what is happening in Ferguson, Missouri. And what does that have to do with us, with our life here? What, what is our obligation 
you know, teachable moments and a sobering moment for all of us here at Vanderbilt University. So there have been several efforts that are happening discreetly and also concretely. So I would hope uh, that many of us will take uh, some leadership role in this and encouraging dialogue and uh, also really encouraging our students to be involved in thinking about issues that concern all of us, whether in Missouri or Tennessee or throughout the world. Um, lastly, um, so what? Uh, how can I get involved? You know, when I became a senator about three years ago, that's when I realized, learned for the first time, that any faculty member can come to the faculty senate meetings. I don't know if you knew that, but I certainly didn't know. It was my sixth year that I learned that. So uh, if you want to get uh, involved a bit more in terms of seeing how the faculty life overall can be improved or how we can give more to the university and vice versa, for it is always dialogical and two-way traffic, come to the regularly scheduled meetings. And uh, I don't know if you know your school senator. Uh, please talk to her or talk to him, talk to them, or the Senate's EC member. And really, I would like to invite that sort of dialogue. And also consider ways as to how our life together at VU can be made better for your participation through the Senate. So, and just keeping uh, the big picture and the first principles as what they are. Speaking of first principles, we all love to teach, we all love to mentor, we all love to research. And at this time, I'm gonna invite Chancellor Nick Zeppos to come and lead us in the recognition of 25 years of service for all these faculty members and others. Chancellor Zeppos. Great to be here, and Paul, I uh, think you'll do a great job. I look forward to serving with you as chair, working with the Senate, and making our university the very best it can be. Our realization of the plan, our full appreciation of our potential is only gonna come through our continued partnership. Uh, Tim, uh, as I've said before, I'd play for you without a scholarship. I'd do push-ups in the mud for you, and uh, you're just an incredible leader. And thanks for that inspiring talk and um, for your foundations and the way in which the program you build reflects so well on the university and brings us great distinction and visibility. You're an outstanding mentor, you're a great teacher and a role model for so many youngsters, but also across the nation. Thanks so much, my friend. I want to welcome all of you and thank you for coming. At standing room only, you must be expecting some extraordinary announcement. And uh, I keep wanting to say, this will be my last year, maybe it'll justify everyone coming, but I don't think that's in the cards uh, yet. Um, as one of the nation's, I mean the world's really greatest universities, we excel in so many areas, and we provide an unparalleled student experience. But we're never content. The issues Paul brought up, our strategy going forward, is aspiring to be better, to serving humanity better than we ever have. I think our environment is unique across the country. I spent a little bit of this summer going on field trips to other campuses, exploring what's happening uh, academically, financially, particularly in the area of, of, of healthcare. And I don't think there is a place like Vanderbilt. I think we're unique and it allows us to get together, to cross disciplines, and to really work as a university, one. I think the faculty assembly is an extraordinary time for us to recognize the achievements of our faculty and to say thank you to our faculty, recognizing that the things you do every day, the classes you teach, the research you do, the care you provide really is extraordinary and that we can't honor enough of what you do because you really are the university. As Paul said, um, and I've passed this speed bump, uh, we're gonna celebrate the faculty who have dedicated 25 years of service to Vanderbilt. Then we're going to uh, present the Chancellor's Award for Research, and then of course, two very important awards, the Thomas Jefferson Award and the Earl Sutherland Prize for Achievement in Research. I always say, and we know that it's the people that makes Vanderbilt special. And it warms my heart to salute the faculty who have devoted 25 years of service to this great institution. 
Each person will receive a chair bearing the Vanderbilt University symbol and a brass plate engraved with their name. I know that all of you will share my enthusiasm in recognizing these good friends, these distinguished members of our university family. However, to keep our program on schedule, I'd ask you please hold your thunderous applause <laughs> until all the names have been called. Faculty, please join me on stage as you hear your name and remain on stage so we can have a group photo made. From the Blair School, Emma Lynn, Emma Lynn Bingham. From the College of Arts and Science, Michael Bess, Joe Harrington. Can I call you Rusty or it says Russell McIntyre? I don't know who that is. Rusty McIntyre, Jeff Shaw, from the School of Engineering, Frederick Rick Hazelton. From the Owen Graduate School of Management, William Christie, Dick Daft. From Peabody, Craig Ann Hefflinger. From the School of Medicine, Naji Abumarat, Jeffrey Creasy, John Downing, Larry Marnett, Jean Fotenauer, Ann Richmond, Michael Tramontana, Arthur Wheeler, John Worrell. A few faculty members could not be with us today, and I would also like to, I would like to recognize their 25 years of service as well. They are Janie Dodario, Ted Hasselbrin, Hal Helderman, Kevin Kelly, Catherine Murray, Andy Tamarkin, Seth Wright. We all fit. Some years we can't. Come on, if you want to get over in the middle, you get a good better in the picture. Slide over. Slide over. Come on, Michael. Come on. Come on. Slide over a little bit. This is like high school. You know, gotta get the car. Right. Congratulations to these extraordinary members of our faculty and our friends for their steadfast commitment, their combined hundreds, thousands of years of service <laughs> to Vanderbilt. I know they have great things ahead, so let's congratulate and thank them. Okay, the Chancellor's Award for Research. These awards recognize excellence in research, scholarship, or creative expression. They are given for works presented or published in the preceding three calendar years. These awards, awards reflect the importance that we place on discovery and finding answers to the complex issues we face in the world. Each of these awards carries a stipend of $1,000, and the recipient receives an engraved pewter cup. If you hear your name announced as an award winner, please stand, make your way to the stage as I share with the audience an all too brief summary of your amazing research that led to your selection for this prize. Paul, please assist me. First Chancellor's Award goes to Seth Bordenstein for his brilliant article in Science Magazine, co-authored with graduate student 
R. M. Brooker, demonstrating the differences of the gut bi microbiome between closely related species of animals reared on the same diet. In addition to this remarkable finding, Seth showed that the constituents and composition of the animal's microbiomes changed in parallel with the genetic relationships of the host species. Seth termed this pattern phylosymbiosis, which like phylogenomics is a metric that retains an ancestral signal of the host's evolution. The publication of this extraordinary work in science garnered attention from the most prestigious publications and media outlets around the world, including Science News, Nature News, and B BBC Radio. For the importance and significance of this path-breaking research, I am extremely pleased to present this award to Seth and extend my congratulations. Great work, Seth. <laughs> The next Chancellor's Award for Research goes to Josh Denny, Associate Professor of Biomedical Informatics and Medicine, for his cover article in Nature Biotechnology describing the first broad-scale validation and implementation of a phenome-wide association study. This type of study, known as FIWAS in biomedical circles, fundamentally changes the way biomedical researchers conduct scientific inquiry. A densely phenotype population is required. And Josh brilliantly used electronic health records. Importantly, FIWAS was also, also provides a systematic method to analyze the condition in which a genetic variant is associated with more than one phenotype. Josh's work has led to novel biomedical discovery and has provided useful tools for other scientists to use in their investigations for his highly impactful and creative methods that are fundamentally changing the way that biomedical science is carried out. I am proud and pleased to present this Chancellor's Award to Josh. Great work, Josh. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm extraordinarily pleased to present the next Chancellor's Research Award to Isabel Gautier, David K. Wilson Chair and Professor of Psychology for her article published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Isabel co-authored this paper with three colleagues, two of whom are Vanderbilt faculty, John Gore and Chris Gatenby. This underscores the depth of talent that exists at Vanderbilt. However, the fact that John Gore suggested Isabel as the sole nominee for this award is a testament to our special collegial environment and to her colleagues' respect for Isabel's formidable intellectual drive and intellectual ability. This paper presents a major contribution in response to a central question in the field of visual cognitive neuroscience. How does the visual system identify objects and faces? It has been believed that the fusiform facial area, or FFA region of the brain, reliably responds to faces, but not to other types of obje objects. Isabel's research supports a very different view, that the FFA responds generally to objects of expertise, such as birds for bird watchers, or cars for car enthusiasts. The findings of this research provide highly compelling evidence that we are not born with a specialized face processor. Rather, a more general, a more general purpose processor that supports responding to and identifying objects of exper expertise. For her ability to see the world in a new way and take on fundamental ideas, to design appropriate experiments that challenge conventional thinking as well, Isabel is most worthy of this award. Congratulations, Isabel.
The fourth Chancellor's Research Award goes to Joel Harrington, Centennial Professor of History, for his brilliant book, The Faithful Executioner, Life and Death, Honor and Shame in the Turbulent 16th Century. With Joel's fascinating account of the life and morbid duties of executioner Franz Schmidt of Nuremberg, Joel has achieved a feat that most academic historians only dream about, a book that appeals to both his academic colleagues and the wider reading public. Thus far, The Faithful Executioner has been translated into 10 foreign languages and it has remained among the top 10 nonfiction bestsellers in Germany for over a year. But it is not only the book's popularity that makes Joel so worthy of this award. It is determined research, his intellectual curiosity, that unearthed a sufficient source material to tell the way of Meister Franz. Joel's quest for information led him to Nuremberg City Library and the Austrian State Archives, where he discovered a manuscript copy completed during the year of Schmidt's death and a petition to Emperor Ferdinand II to restore this executioner's family's good name. With these newfound documents, Joel patched together the portrait of a man whose 45-year career of executions reveals a person more complex insightful, reflective than one might imagine. For so many reasons, for his intellectual curiosity, for his diligence that unlocked the mystery of this unusual life, the amazing keen eye for detail, and magnificent storytelling skills, I am very pleased to present Joel with this award. Joel, congratulations. Today's final Chancellor's Award for Research goes to Holly McCammon, Professor of Sociology for her book, The U.S. Women's Jury Movement and Strategic Adoption. An amazing piece of work that draws on detailed archival data from 15 states, Holly tirelessly and brilliantly traces the series of events that led to women eventually winning the right to sit on juries against the background infused with theoretical, historical, sociological, and indeed moral significance. Her study illuminates how women mobilized to change jury laws and expand their fundamental rights of citizenship. Holly is praised, as we all know, as a master, an absolute master in marshalling data and making it speak to significant questions with compelling theoretical logic and sound, strong evidence. Her writing brings increased understanding to the 20th century women's movement, and it offers for all of us an important historical corrective on the time period between the suffrage struggle of the early decade and the women's movement emerging in the 1960s. For this incredibly brilliant work that deepens our knowledge of how the U.S. jury system functioned, which we should never forget in a gender exclusionary fashion, but then changed through a variety of state-by-state -state processes inspired by the movement. It is my honor and privilege to present Holly with this award and I offer her and our heartiest congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> The Thomas Jefferson Award is made annually for distinguished service to Vanderbilt through extraordinary contributions as a member of the faculty in the councils and in the governance of the university. This honor comes with an engraved pewter goblet and a $2,500 prize. This year's recipient of the Thomas Jefferson Award is Kathy Fuchs, Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics.
Kathy's long history at Vanderbilt ranks her in that rarest of societies known as quadruple door. And are you a faculty grad too? Were your father a faculty member? My father was a teacher. Yeah, okay. Look at that. Quadruple door, completing her BA in molecular biology with honors, she continued on to graduate from the School of Medicine, then completed an internship, residency, and fellowship at Vanderbilt, and has since served continuously with dedication, insight, and compassion as one of our most brilliant and dedicated faculty members. Kathy, on a campus of true servant leaders, she stands out for some, as someone who cares deeply about the university and its people, strengthening and bettering Vanderbilt with her unique sig signature of compassion, determination, advocacy, consensus building. She has served on the faculty senate, a term as a chair, including a term as a chair, and numerous other committees and task forces. Despite carrying an enormous workload herself, she consistently finds time to nurture the next generation of educators and healthcare providers. She is an exemplary physician who works tirelessly to improve the health and education of the community by implementing policies that will make lasting improvements and improve people's lives for years and decades to come. Her colleagues have shared many, many examples of Kathy's caring leadership, and I've been witness to them firsthand. Today, let me just focus on one here. Her service as director of the Psychological and Counseling Center. In two short years, Kathy has re-envisioned the PCC's mission and reorganized its services to transform the crucial center into a national model a national model for taking care of our community in, in psychological and psychiatric care for young adults. Should we have any higher aspiration? I don't think so. Kathy has made a profound impact on the life of our community and it is with deep appreciation and respect, Kathy, that I bestow upon you the Thomas Jefferson Award. Congratulations. Final award, the Nobel Prize of Vanderbilt. <laughs> or, as I tell the people in Oslo, the Sutherland Prize of Sweden. <laughs> the Earl Sutherland Prize for Achievement in Research, the most prestigious honor that Vanderbilt bestows on a faculty member in recognition of his or her accomplishments in research, scholarship, or creative expression. It is presented annually to a member of the Vanderbilt faculty whose achievements in research, scholarship, or creative expression have achieved significant critical acclaim and are recognized nationally or internationally as a leader in her field. The prize consists of $5,000 and an engraved pewter julep cup. The winner's name is added to a silver bowl, a who's who of faculty at Vanderbilt that the recipient keeps for a year. Today, I take great delight in awarding the Sutherland Prize to Jane Landers, Gertrude Conaway Professor of History. Jane? teacher and a great colleague, Jane is celebrated as Anne, perhaps the international expert for her work on Caribbean and Atlantic world history with an emphasis on the subject of slavery and emancipation during the 18th and 19th centuries. Indeed, her work has simply redefined the way Latin American historians envisioned the role of the Caribbean and the southern regions of North America in the history of Latin America. As the author of seven books and 38 peer-reviewed articles, Jane's work has been recognized repeatedly with several prominent national awards, 
including grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and, and keep going back, because they keep giving an amazing six times from the National Endowment for the Humanities. She's a highly sought after public speaker. You can catch her on a TEDx talk, or we can all go to Cambridge, where she'll be giving a lecture series at Harvard this fall. At Vanderbilt, Jane has directed the Center for Latin American Studies and has overseen an internationally funded Brazilian exchange program that has brought more than 50 Brazilian students to our campus and has expanded the horizons of Vanderbilt students in an immersion program in Brazil. Among her many remarkable projects, and one that mirrors Jane's propensity for combining cutting edge research with significant significant public outreach and impact is her creation of a publicly accessible database of more than 750,000 digital copies and transcriptions of documents related to African and Afro-descended people in four Latin American countries. What a remarkable resource and what a remarkable public good. Combing through a variety of local archives and churches, Jane and her teams of academic experts amassed and painstakingly digitized, record, digitized records of baptisms, marriages, last wills and testaments, and other manuscripts that simply provide enormous insight. And tell the stories, tell the stories that we must hear, we must learn from enslaved and freed people of African descent. It fills me with great pride to recognize Jane's amazing and valuable contributions to Vanderbilt students, her commitment to excellence, collaboration, projects in the humanities, and her amazing ability to garner significant grants that fund this extraordinary research. Jane, I am so pleased and proud to present you with the Earl Sutherland Prize for Achievement in Research. Congratulations, Jane. telling Jane I was on campus on Sunday and I was walking up to, uh, kind of up to library lawn and I looked over at Benson Science, such a beautiful quiet day. I looked in the bottom and there was Jane on a Sunday afternoon working in her office. And so what a dedicated mm -hmm. scholar and a great citizen. Amazing. Well, I get to say a few words now and uh, Jay Clayton usually times me and I think Jay is here. Jay, are you still here? Yeah, Jay's here. And so he'll, he'll, he'll hold me to, to, to whatever I do wrong. Uh, first of all, it's great to be back for the fall semester. I always see this as a time of getting out of my shorts, putting on a blue suit, and a time of rebirth, a renewal annually of our commitment to research, teaching, and service. Our new students arrive with the greatest of optimism, incredible curiosity filled with human potential. That is all matched by your inspired teaching, your pressing inquiries, your setting very high expectations for accident, academic excellence, and your devotion to improving our world. Our campus is just a thing of beauty, but the truly beautiful is found in Professor Leah Lowe's first year writing seminar examining theatrical credibility. Professor Doug Adams' amazing laboratory for systems integrity and reliability investigating multimodal dynamic testing of myriad materials and machines. And Dr. Jim Crow's work with other top virologists from around the world to stop the spread of chikungunya virus. Today, I feel as excited and hopeful to be back at school as the year when I arrived to teach one else back in 1987. I've now reached, which a number of you probably have, the point of crossover in my career. Our freshman classes now include young people whose parents were my law students. But even so, every year, Vanderbilt makes me feel young again, every fall. It's now my time to give you a report on the health of the university, and I have good news to share and high hopes for the year. 
Vanderbilt begins the 2014-15 academic year in an exceptionally strong position, academically, financially, and culturally. This is not to say we are without challenges or obstacles, but I'm happy to be able to share with you many signs of strength and distinction as we begin another great year. Our faculty is stronger, more distinguished, more diverse, more productive than ever. Research funding increased last year despite congressional cuts. The number of faculty awards received continues to grow in every field. And is there a university with a broader base of disciplines and excellence? Excellence, the values of merit and opportunity, inclusion, diversity, all drive our philanthropic support. I'm very pleased to tell you that we have again had another record year in giving to Vanderbilt. We will soon begin a capital campaign, and I could not be more bullish about our prospects. And last but not least, we won a national championship in baseball. As far as users presidents go, I've had a very enjoyable year. We continue to invest in new spaces to further our mission and ensure our long-term sustainability and excellence. This summer, we broke ground on a new engineering and science building. It will provide a home to new and existing trans institutional programs and a place for students, faculty, staff, and visiting entrepreneurs and discoverers can gather in an environment dedicated to research, discovery, innovation. Two new residential colleges, Moore and Warren, have opened. These are a critical next step in building Vanderbilt's living and learning community following the immense success of the, as, of the Martha River Ingram's Commons. Plans are now in the works for adding a new tower to the Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital to meet the ever-increasing demands for care and accommodate the continuing new discovery at Vanderbilt and Children's Health. It gives me enormous pleasure that there are so many positive and encouraging stories to share about what is going on at Vanderbilt this year. But it wouldn't be candid of me, it would not be truthful of me, however, to fail to mention that the university continues to struggle and struggle deeply with areas of great concern and pain. I've stopped hoping for any solutions from Washington, D.C. But the financial pressures on our medical center are now enormous. A once in a generation shift is occurring in American healthcare. And as I traveled around the country this summer, it was amazing how people see big change going on, coming their way. A combination of factors is making it harder and harder to pay the bills here and at other university hospitals. These disappearing sources of revenue, the failure to expand Medicaid in Tennessee are hitting us really hard. New payment models are also arriving every day, all of them offering up more risk at the same time as we wave goodbye to traditional pay-for-service fee structures. We continue to be asked to shoulder enormous responsibilities to care for the poor throughout the state and the region. We, of course, remain committed to our not-for-profit mission of educating and discovering. And we will continue to serve these aims as we strive the hardest to continue to provide care for the indigent and the uninsured. But a health system, and here I include local, state, national governments, as well as the insurance industry, that continues to ask its nation's universities and academic medical centers to make medical discoveries produce the very best physicians, the very best scientists, at the same time that we increasingly shoulder the taxing responsibilities for a public hospital is headed for trouble. The shifting of societal health care costs onto university and other not-for-profit hospitals is neither fair nor sustainable in the long term. We're seeing that. So far, to many, it is a fairly well-hidden if significant cost. But it's one that is apparent every day to nurses, physicians, and staff, and the universities that own these hospitals, but not to the wider community, and certainly not to lawmakers. All of us who are now bearing ever higher percentage of our community's health care costs will soon reach a place where we simply, we simply cannot be asked to tighten our belts any further. There's got to be a different approach. Even in the face of these challenges, biomedical and nursing education research 
remain outstanding at Vanderbilt. We had a 10% growth in grant awards, a 15% increase in applicants to the School of Medicine, and we were again selected by Truven Analytics as a top 100 hospital. The only academic medical center honored 14 times. That's like John Wood. I continue, I continue to hold steadfast to the belief that at Vanderbilt, at Vanderbilt, we are best positioned to create solutions. If we can find good partners that our nation is facing as it undergoes these seismic changes in healthcare, I continue to have great faith and deep admiration for the Vanderbilt physicians, nurses, faculty, staff, and students who will be at the forefront and being asked to develop the most and much more efficient, equitable, and progressive healthcare system. One that our great nation deserves. Our challenges are clear, but the year ahead will be one of new initiatives and bold steps taken. A year ago, I announced the beginning of a strategic planning process, and I asked you, our faculty, to lead this important undertaking. I laid out four areas, as Paul mentioned, to start this community conversation. These four areas were to define the residential undergraduate research university of the 21st century. Nothing less than that is acceptable. To forge new connections in our richly diverse university, to grow new and sustain and expand existing trans-institutional research and education programs that will be the best in class and transform society. To bring all of our unique resources to bear for solving local and global healthcare problems. To interrogate, to ask hard questions, to investigate and innovate in new media and educational technologies. I ask that this process be faculty driven. I want it to be transparent. I want it to be inclusive. And I wanted it to be completed in one year. My confidence you could not have been better repaid by your enthusiastic embrace of the process and the draft plan produced. At a retreat in June attended by the Board of Trusts, and a number of faculty, the Board of Trust enthusiastically endorsed this plan. <clears throat> it has exceeded my expectations, and I'm grateful to the hundreds and hundreds of faculty who engage deeply in this work. I'm especially grateful to the two faculty members who led this effort, Susan Wente and John Gear. And of course, proving that no good deed goes unpunished. Susan is now our new provost, <laughs> and John, while he was in Vermont, out of the jurisdiction, we asked him and he agreed to chair the ANS Dean Search Committee. I think the Dean Search is in great hands and I believe Susan will be our greatest provost ever, by far. We will continue to engage in dialogue and debate the plan. Of course, we're an academic institution. Knowledge is contingent at times. We must always be in the process of what are we doing, why are we doing it? But we also have to realize we're on the go. Now is the time to begin to act. Our mission is too important, our ambitions too bold, and our momentum too strong to wait. This year we will see a number of key investments in new programs and faculty, and they will reflect our commitment to the timeless values of discovery and teaching. They will directly and forcefully meet the challenges we now face. Our primacy and basic research in the biomedical sciences simply must be assured. And we must engage in substantial new investment in basic sciences toward that end. I want to emphasize the basic. Currently, and in the past, there have been two major drivers of basic biomedical research. They're both in jeopardy. Clinical margins declining nationally, and federal funding is wanting in scope and focus and generosity. We cannot sit back and worry, for doing so ignores that there are great discoveries that are waiting to be made at Vanderbilt. Provost Wente and I will be announcing a series of substantial investments in cutting edge research of a fundamental nature. Basic fundamental research is the foundation for all applied and translational breakthroughs. It's the reason why you, brilliant, curious faculty, enter the academy. And it is still why 
curious, bright young people around the globe are inspired to follow each of you. Countering this fact, however, there's a troubling and highly vocal insistence often heard today that basic research is a waste of time. Don't know where it's going to lead us. The results could be uncertain. Listen to this kind of talk, I grow more concerned, more and more concerned, and I want to be at Tim's school, that we live in a society that's increasingly limited by short-term time horizons. The photos, well, they're going to be gone on Instagram, I guess. Maybe not. Politics, series of media frenzies, quarterly earnings, success or failure. More and more, too often, generous and even well-intended funders want to move quickly to, are we going to get the cure? We know that the cure, we know that the cure, whether it's an ill of ma mind, body, or spirit, is the end we all seek. That's why we come here every day. But it grows increasingly difficult to persuade others that basic science and discovery is the means to that end. When you Google anything that memory momentarily fails to provide, you iChat, you Skype, instantly, with one loved ones around the world. I think it can skew your perspective on how long does it really take to do great research. I think of all the award winners today. How long did it take to design that experiment, Isabel? Joel, what was it like to go into those unexamined archives? What was it like to gather data Jane, that weren't designed for that. There was no one there saying, here it is. That's how we answer fundamental questions about nature, the universe, and life. As a university focused every day, every day on cures, care, translational research of the highest order, we are in a privileged position, a position of privilege to understand the essential importance of the foundations of basic research. In this spirit, our strategic plan endorses the targeting of new trans-institutional programs, emerging areas of fundamental science where Vanderbilt can lead in research, as well as continued growth and funding for areas where we know we're best in class. We can be even better. We'll be announcing a new Chancellor's Faculty Fellows Program that will ensure research support for outstanding faculty, particularly those at mid-career, to pursue bold, new, risky ideas that, frankly, some of the funders are much too risk-averse to go forward with. We have to take those risks. As we invest in basic sciences, mathematics, we must recognize our opportunities as well to be a truly exceptional university in balance. Vanderbilt's historic distinction in the humanities and social sciences provides us with an unparalleled advantage. I am deeply, deeply troubled at the prospect of the crowding out of humanistic inquiry I see at other colleges and universities and by the narrow attacks I hear on social science research. It is occurring everywhere even on campuses of the greatest universities that we admire. I believe there are a number of forces at work. Tight budgets combined with a tilt towards science and engineering are leading universities, I believe, unfortunately, to underinvest in the humanities and social sciences. The sluggish economy has only intensified the need for a secure link between what's your major, what are you studying, and can you get a job? Sadly, political forces are also at play, sometimes quite legitimate, but oftentimes hyperbolic and disdainful of academic areas that help define humanity and explain political behavior. I don't mean to minimize at all the need for all of our graduates to find jobs. I'm in a particular mood today because my two sons, recent college graduates, are employed but none of today's noisy debates. And our plan makes this clear about the value a liberal education has in any way undermined my abiding belief 
that the ability to read an ancient language, to take on a difficult task of translation, to investigate and explain Plato, Shakespeare, to understand why do people vote certain ways? It looks like it's against their interest. To explain the cause of two world wars of the past century. I believe those things and our inquiry into them and taking students on those journeys will hold them in good stead in our global economy. Scientific, dis scientific discovery is important. What really makes it worthwhile is because it speaks to our humanity. The decoding of the human genome was a discovery that both signaled this incredible, rich diversity of life through the virtually unlimited placement of base pairs on the double helix. But it revealed the common humanity we all share. The tracing of each of us back to a common ancestor out of Africa through mitochondrial DNA drew a beautiful picture of the tree of life and the rich diversity. Yet it also said, we're all in this together as humanity. We're all actually descended from a single ancestor. Genealogy lies at the heart of all we do. Genealogy is the heart of all we do in science, humanities, social sciences. The breakthroughs in each discipline are all transformative of how do we view ourselves on this planet. Just as Darwin observed the tree of life through these finches from his voyages, scholars in the Renaissance and after began to notice these seemingly common roots of languages. Their narrow compass, of course, got them looking at Latin and Greek, perhaps other European languages. But imagine the excitement, the overturning of orthodoxy, the new thinking that occurred when the same inquiry noticed that words in Persian and words in Sanskrit shared similar common roots. Our understanding of ourselves and all of the things we thought about ourselves and the other people totally rethought, changed dramatically. Vanderbilt must be a beacon in this area of academic inquiry. Our outstanding faculty in the humanities, the social sciences, coupled with our strength in science, math, and engineering. We have so many successes the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, the Latin American Popular Opinion Project, Medicine, Health, and Society, and just the greatness, but the potential in inchoate of the Robert Penn Warren Center, they all call for us to reaffirm the importance of the humanities and the social sciences. We are opposed to engage in conversations, creative thinking, and bold investments as we move forward and implement our strategic plan. In the spring assembly, I don't know if any of you remember this, I spoke of the need for a university strategic investment fund of $50 million to accelerate our progress. I think that was one of the things that Susan remembered when she interviewed for the job. Our strategic plan calls for a trans-institutional faculty led by faculty across the university through a trans-institutional council. You must take on this creative responsibility. This council will focus on all areas of the university, every discipline, but all areas of our mission, teaching, research, service, curriculum. We will find the new opportunities, we will leverage them, and we will leverage and grow the existing opportunities. As I said, we have challenges, but we have too much momentum, and the ideas are too important. I have full confidence, full confidence in your participation with Provost Wente to invest and to steward this fund to take Vanderbilt to the next level. Over the summer, two stories appeared in the media that gave Vanderbilt some very high rankings. The first published in Forbes, it was a ranking of schools by average SAT scores. Vanderbilt was listed seventh ahead of Stanford, Northwestern, Duke, and a number of other really great schools. For many, the mere mention of a standardized test and having to do well on it
can aggravate stress. I've seen it lead to outbreaks of hives. That's why it's very gratifying to see the second piece, published by the Princeton Review, based on student surveys, ranked Vanderbilt students as America's happiest college students. We were first on that list. That's a rare and powerful combination to be recognized in one summer. And I think for me and for all of us, it speaks, it speaks to why Vanderbilt is so special. We are academically distinguished. We always strive for absolute excellence. Look at the awards we gave away today. We value collegiality, civility, friendship, community. Look at the 25-year chair awards. We strive for that sense of balance. We'll be great in science. We're going to be great in the humanities. We're going to be an academic institution of the first order. And we're going to win the NCAA baseball championship. We are going to be the university that does that. And we're doing it today. But we cannot take these achievements and certainly our reputation, our great reputation for granted. Excellence, measures of happiness, as Kathy knows all too well, a sense of wellness, all depend on welcoming and having a safe campus and a safe, welcoming community. When we fail to help, or worse, when we hurt someone, when we hurt someone, when we don't help someone, we break this trust and we tear the fabric of this special community that we all cherish. This applies all we, to all that we do. Nowhere, however, is it as true, as Paul mentioned, as the area of campus safety and freedom from power-based violence. Tremendous, tremendous attention has been focused on this topic on many campuses, including Vanderbilt. There is proposed legislation from Congress. There's a lot of litigation arising out of these incidents, and that will only increase. Federal law, but our own, our own responsibilities as teachers, mentors, leaders, professors, oblige us to create that safe, safe, welcoming environment. And to find ways to always guide, always support, always be there, always know where the best place for care is on our campus. This effort will be enhanced, first of all, if we understand our goals here. But let me implore you also to consider availing yourself of training that's available on the campus to signal to others that you care and to confirm to yourself that you care and that you know what to do. Let us daily, in acts and deeds, in words, in achievements, earn our distinction of the happiest university, a great academic institution, by doing all we can to make Vanderbilt free any kind of power-based violence or, or discrimination of any kind have neither any place in what we hold high as an academic community. Let me close by saying once again, I feel very grateful to be your faculty colleague and to serve as your chancellor of Vanderbilt and to do it with such a distinguished and committed faculty and staff many of whom are my friends that I joined more than 25 years ago. We are widely admired for our focus on academic achievement as well as our commitment to community, sense of happiness, human connection. Our challenges are large, but we're really in this together. We are the university. The faculty is the university. I have no doubt that the coming year will continue to prove our reputation true by all that we do. Thank you so much, and please join me for a reception.